Hello everybody, thank you for coming and joining to hear me talk about how to build effective and efficient sock. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of research on how socks are perceived and how they're performing. You probably will have recently seen the webinar with Dan LaMorena and Larry Ponemon discussing our findings there, that research report. This is really a follow-up to that to talk about how can we be more effective and efficient in the future? What does security operations, which you know really is a larger concept than just SOC, look like as we go into the future? So I'm gonna share some thoughts here. Uh, I've only got about 15 slides, so I'll bore you to death for at least 45 minutes. No, it's, it's good information. Um, it's a lot of what can work, what has worked, and what is old way, new way. So sort of how do we compare and contrast when we see the changes. I'm also gonna try and explain what some of those changes are. Um, the first thing though that I really have to say, and this is super important, is this. We are not protecting ourselves online. We are defending ourselves. And I think that there's an important thing, mental switch maybe, that we need to go ahead and trigger. We're not going to be able to run security and security operations the same way we run information technology. It's not about maturity and availability and performance and scalability and all of those things that are super important in IT. We are playing a game with two people involved. This is chess. There is someone across the board from us and that someone wants to steal what we have. We both, attacker and defender, have super strong economic incentive. So this is not going to change. We have to do business on the internet. And everywhere humans go, we bring criminality and nation states and geopolitics and, and conflict with us. Um, and so this is something that is just going to be true into the future. The internet is a dangerous place and we are gonna continue to have to do business there. Um, you know, one of the things I always talk about is that asymmetry between attacker and defender. In general, the attacker, no matter what defense you put in place, they're going to find a way around it. They're going to continuously adapt because they try something, it fails, they try something else. Um, they can just wait for an opportunity. They're going to be presented one. You send enough emails, someone will click the link. It's guaranteed. We have to be able to find these folks and it's cat and mouse. It's not production infrastructure, it's cat and mouse and we need to start approaching it that way. So what has been the problem? And anyone that's heard me talk in the last four years or even more than that, know that the problem has been that we put people in the middle. We take all of this data, all of this information, these sensors, this you know, SIM, we put it out and we always, no matter where you're doing it, whether you're doing it at a managed security services provider or you're doing it yourself, eventually it comes down to a console and a human. And that human has to find bad. And this is where we are having trouble. But there's also other issues, things that are changing in the market around us. The technology of how a SOC works and how security operations works is completely up for grabs. There's a whole host of competing approaches. So if you look at this spreadsheet, on the vertical columns, you see on-premise SIM, SIM in the cloud, MSSP, MDR, data lake, data lake in the cloud, security orchestration and automation and response. These are competing approaches. Nobody has quite figured out exactly how we're gonna connect all of these or which one of these is going to win. And then if you look down, you see SIEM and SOC functions, data collection normalization. This is uh, based on a blog that I wrote a couple of years ago. It's on our website about the seven fragments of SIM. Um, and SIM does multiple things. These are those things. These are the features, the main features that humans use. Data collection normalization, bringing in context, detection logic. What is the form of logic you use to detect? Workflow and then that decision. It all comes down to a human making a decision and then there's downstream activities. When you look at the color coding, there's things that are decent at it, there's things where it's mediocre or it's super difficult to do, and then there's places where it's just plain not good. 
um, you know, data lake in the cloud does not bring in your enterprise context. All of your asset information, all of your user information, things that are important to making good security decisions are not there. And so if you can't put context with telemetry, you have a real problem with your detection logic. These things all flow into each other. And so there's really, a, you know, there's nothing, a winner has not been decided, I guess is the best way to say it. At Respond Software, we are very focused on what is needed to and then making that really good decision mathematically, consistently, so forth and so on. When that is possible, a lot of what this jumble looks like actually goes away and we can change really the layer of abstraction that we all we operate at in security operations. And that's what I'm going to talk about through most of this talk. So really to sort of set it up in the, you know, sort of the highest, most pithy way, the old way of doing things was to stream as much information as possible at a human until they fell over on their keyboard and went to sleep. Um, you know, 12 hours into a shift at two o'clock in the morning, I will not admit to it, but it's probably been me sleeping on that console once or twice. It's super hard to do. It's just not optimized for humans. I'm gonna talk about that in more detail. We have to change that layer of abstraction. It's not that, that using humans as a detection engine is not working. Humans are best at managing bad, working together to manage bad. So the new way is going to be far more command center and, and situation center is what I'm calling it, where people are working together and collaborating to manage bad out of the environment. It's far more optimized for you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as people at work. We work with other people, we manage problems, you know, we run projects. I'm gonna talk about that as well. So now just digging in, we're ca I'm calling this the Security Situation Center, but it doesn't matter what you call it. You know, people never called their socks a sock. They had the, the Global Threat Interdiction Center and you know, names that were designed to sell it to the people that worked there and sell it to the rest of the organization is super important in detecting bad things in the environment. And it was, it was just not optimally set up. The, the where human meets machine was broken. Um, we also had a failure in mission statement in a lot of ways. What we have done in security operations traditionally is detect an incident, often from impact or user calling in or an email in the SOC inbox. We run an incident response on it, and then we remediate that incident and we do a lessons learned with the analyst that detected it, and we're done. Well, that doesn't complete the swing on the actual larger problem. You know, I have this mission statement here. We really need to be looking at what is the fastest path, meaning with the least friction, to get from sensor to all the way to systemic immunity. So from the time that I see any sort of suspicious indicator in my sensor grid until my entire enterprise cannot be breached in that attack method, that's the most important thing that we should track and that should be the mission of the SOC. It's not done when the incident is remediated. remediated. It's actually done when that incident is no longer possible anywhere else within your organization. Um, and this is something that is now gonna be available to us when we don't have to put people on console. We're gonna be able to complete the swing, working with IT to get all the way to systemic immunity. Um, the things that a situation center is gonna give us are new organizational flexibility, which I'll show you specifically what I mean by that, much less formal process and procedure, new roles and skills for your team members. So your early SOC are not gonna be, or your early you know, security operations employees are not gonna be level one console analysts. They're gonna be hunters and sensor grid engineers and much more engaged in helping defend the organization. Um, and it's gonna be a better job for them. You're gonna have much lower turnover. Um, it's just a great you know, outcome for everyone and you're gonna have more resources to do more in security. Nobody ever has enough resources in security. When you have more resources, what could you be doing? And so now let me talk about this you know, in the way that we always talk about SOC. And that is people, process, and technology. When you look at this, on the left is traditional operations 
focused. We are focused on the operations. And what that means, you know, very specifically, if you look all the way at the bottom in the people tasks, console monitoring, shift handovers, shift, you know, inner shift communications, triage, analysis, investigation, gathering context, writing up, you know, findings that you come across as you're sitting console. Um, those are the tasks as they're done today and they're very structured they're very formal so you see process the methods we're using are traditional industrial process control we want to have high repeatability especially as service providers when it's an mssp or an mdr that's providing services um, there's a, a huge thing in customer service that people are able to predict how you operate and you're going to cover things in a sort of a structured way it's really structured, it's very formal, and it's very painful, to be honest. I mean, nobody wants to be buried at the bottom of a pile of process and procedure. It's, it's mind-numbing. Um, and that's going to actually go away. And then technology, right? It's, the technology was always centered on the sim. I'm going to go grab all the data I possibly can, whether or not I know what I'm going to do with that data. Um, I'm going to put it into the sim. I'm going to use all those features and functions in order to find bad. But I have a problem at the end of the sim as a console with a human. And that means I've got to tune my sensors down. I've got to reduce the volume. The sim funnel is something we've talked about forever. And what that basically means is I'm going to blind you to everything but a pinprick of the amount of data that you can look at and make decisions about. And there's just too many tools to manage. These platform type technologies require engineering, require lots of input, require lots of work, care and feeding um, to keep them up running and relevant. And even when we say they're up running and relevant, I know for a fact, and everyone here that's worked in a SOC knows that we only look at one out of a million uh, in, the, in the terms of events that we collect into that sim. And that's just not enough to find the modern bad guys. When we can shift over from being operations focused to being situation focused, then we're gonna really flip the thing on its head. We're gonna have people doing roles that are far more interesting. They're gonna be focused on sensor engineering, hunt and data science, security automation, threat intelligence, even though I, you know, threat intelligence is of dubious value and we'll be publishing some, some reports along those lines here shortly, um, managing the incidents and getting all the way to systemic remediation. There's way better roles, there's way better skills there and the technology is no longer where we have to center on it. We can center on bad guys. Instead of focusing on the sim, we can focus on the adversary and try and predict what their courses of action might be and how we are gonna frustrate and anger and send them packing without what they came for, um, stolen from us. So I, I would much rather center on the adversary and the situation that adversary is causing. And then process and procedure gets way less formal. We don't need super structured procedure by procedure, perk chart diagram, type processes. We just need to document who we're going to talk to when certain things happen. We need to socialize that with them, get some agreement about how that conversation will be documented and tracked. And it's just easier and, and more functional as we go forward. We're also going to try and have a lot more organizational flexibility and a lot more engagement with IT and our peers as we help them keep their infrastructure up in the face of deliberate maliciousness where what they're mostly used to dealing with is you know the the user problem which is non-deliberate maliciousness um, so this is the difference between being operations focused and being situation focused so hands down my favorite slide here is what I've learned over the last four years about how you align humans and machines and look at it more as a coworker relationship rather than a human using a tool. The tool is doing a job that used to be a human task that the human never really wanted to do anyway. And the human is doing a job that is far more oriented on the organization and the adversary, but they're also working together and sharing information. The, the machine doesn't know what's relevant, the human does, so the human needs to tell the machine. 
The human doesn't know how relevant it is until it's been subjected to mathematical analysis. And the machine can do that and tell us back how relevant these things are. So there's an information flow between human and machine that is really important in terms of how we are going to do this analysis. And that's giving feedback to the things that are surface, right? That is, you know, in the data science terms, that is supervised learning. We're, you know, creating uh, a, a, a set of data that we have labeled as, yes, this is malicious and no, this is not malicious. And the machine continuously uses that to get smarter and better. So when you look at it, you see the bottom of these, right? On a machine, what do you get? Consistency, depth, accuracy, memory, and so forth. These are really important traits that humans just don't have. We can't do a lot of this. We can't solve 60 dimension joint probability problems in our sleep. So we have to let machines do that. But machines can't do the three most important things. They can't be curious, they can't be creative, and they can't collaborate. Humans need to be pulling threads, finding novel ways to detect bad guys, looking for hyper current attack methods so that you know they've read the news and now they've gone and translated, okay, this is what's happening in the, in the underground today, this is what's going on in the internet, and I'm gonna go figure out where that would happen to me and see if I have it happening, and I'm gonna put a trap in so if it does happen, I can immediately be notified. That is novel and hunting and investigation and preparing to defend yourself. So these are really good you know, ways that we work together with machines in the future when the machines are finding bad and we're dealing with it, but we're also looking for bad as well. And I'll talk more about how our emphasis needs to change and sort of the organizational structure to that. So the next thing is we need more organizational flexibility and security. We're very line and box chart oriented. We have great big teams that focus on monitoring and that do engineering and feed that monitoring. We spend a little bit of time at Threat Intel. We definitely have incident response because we have incidents that come in you know, not from the SOC that are user reported. And we almost get to do no hunting. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources, we don't have the data. Even when we can get the data, it doesn't retrieve fast enough. Um, you know, we start a query, go to lunch, come back, go on vacation, come back, finally the query's back and it says, sorry, failed to complete. I don't know how many of us have felt that pain, but it's, it's terrible. We need to be able to get at that data to make those decisions. This is sort of the traditional way. Moving forward, there's a new paradigm, and this is a really good book that I recommend called Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal, and it's talking about how do you build an organization that has a shared consciousness, or it's a networked organization. So instead of emailing from you know my tower and box over to your tower and box and working everything in a, in a in an email, not collaborative way, we need to set up task forces. So non-permanent organization to solve specific problems in security. Things change every day. We have ransomware this week, we have distributed denial of service next week, and then we have crypto mining the week after that. These are different types of problems. They're looked for in different ways. There's different policies and, and security controls to protect and defend against them. Uh, and then we have bad guys doing reconnaissance. You know, there's just so much that changes in security that why would we use permanent organizations when we could set up task forces? And even more than that, we can have IT and security on the same task forces working together as coworkers and friends rather than throwing emails back and forth at each other and seeing who has the biggest inbox. So when you look at this, there's also a change in emphasis when you, monitoring goes very small, we only need to put in you know, monitoring that's automated, you know, triggered and alerts on maybe core business things. The rest of the monitoring is handled by autonomous software, which automatically leverages threat intelligence. So then the emphasis for us is gonna be on hunting and improving our sensor grid. Right now, the sensor grid is tuned down so far because of the human in the middle, when we can tune it up and put a lot more emphasis and 
effort into our sensors and the information we collect, we've got a much richer hunting ground. So both of those are very important and they're connected to each other. We're also going to tune up more incidents and we're going to treat those incidents more like a situation that needs to be defended against than just remediated. Um, and that's where I say active defense. And active defense is you know, a little bit of command and control through the executive and line of business organizations within security, but it's how incident responders and IT folks come together in a task force to solve these problems. So this is, I think, a really important change um, in security. Instead of knowing every day when I come to work that my job is to sit down in front of a console, for the next three weeks, I'm gonna solve this problem with these folks, that's remediated, I'll report back in, give me the next problem and the next group of people that were the right folks to solve it within the business and we'll set off on that one and we'll be back to you when it's solved. This is a way to approach this. It changes constantly, it also keeps you engaged in work. It's a much more interesting and set of exposures and things to do, plus you can be there all the way through to the end. You, from the time we detect something until we fully made the organization not vulnerable to it, I was involved and that means I get that sense of accomplishment of protecting my organization. So I really like this idea of organizational flexibility. You almost are going to manage this like a consulting business where you have lots of consultants and then you have the, the resource deployment manager that sends the consultants to various places. When they get there, there's a project manager or a program manager that that's who they work for on that project while they're assigned and then they're redeployed when that project is done to other clients. It's a very similar mindset and it's the way we can you know, get more value out of the security folks that we have in our organization. They almost function like internal consultants. So this is a really old uh, chart that I came up with in actually 2007, I remember vividly, uh, where I just captured the, the categories of process and procedure that we need to do security operations. This has changed with when you have autonomous monitoring, many of these categories become fully automated. What used to be a step-by-step -step procedure that a human would execute in order to complete an analytical task, that's now completely moved into software. And the humans can focus on subtle event detection and reporting, which means communicating what they are seeing and finding those things that cannot be detected with autonomous monitoring, looking for novel attacks, looking for hypercurrent or zero days, uh, but also focusing on sensors. And there's just a lot of, when all of this goes away, there's a lot of rigor that's removed and that gives you time and energy to focus on things and go faster. So this is just a quick, you know, each one of these are sort of how process and procedure used to function and how it's going to change, right? It used to be about maturity and repeatability, but, you know, as I've said a thousand times, we could end up, and actually very often did, end up uh, repeating the wrong things. When an adversary is agile and we are um, highly dogmatic, they're going to win every time. So we are going to get far more agile, we're going to be a lot more informal, but we are still going to document process and procedures. And they're mostly going to be focused on collaboration and acceleration. This is the one that's super hard because we've got to convince our IT brethren that we're not going to break something. And they know that we might, and we know that we might, but we're going to try and convince them that we won't um, because we're going to have to respond faster than we do. We need to be able to take very serious actions within our IT environment within minutes to hours rather than you know sometimes hours to days or weeks. So this idea of acceleration is something that we've got to pre-plan, we've got to prepare, and we've got to socialize. What is that chain? What are the big decision makers? Who are the big decision makers? And can we prepare them to make that decision in a timely way when we come to them with sort of pre-arranged courses of action? So this is why it's, it's going to be a much better way. The old way of doing it was really focused on human failures. Um, I've been a SOC manager years and years and years. When I had 
problems. When I failed at something within security operations, I always had a new process or procedure to fix that. That, that you know, bamboo scaffolding is going to collapse all around us so that we can be way more focused on just what procedures and process do I need to interact with people. Uh, it was also very top down and dictated. Here's how we're going to do things. This is how we're going to fix the problem. Whereas now it's going to be more like I was on this task force. We were working with this team. We realized that network engineering was not really well connected to application engineering. And so we needed both of those. And the people who are doing the work are going to recognize these and then bring it up and socialize it and just put a quick process in place. Hey, here's how I'm going to work between the network and the applications teams. I'm going to write it down so the next person that needs to get these teams coordinating with security has a way to do it. Right, the, the old way of looking at this, we had a business as usual static situation. And that static situation was, I'm streaming data at you, you are looking at it and finding bad. And that is your whole job, that's it, 12 hours a day, you know, four days on, three days off, three days on, four days off, weeks, years, 24-7, 365, right? That's terrible. We need to be dealing with these constantly emerging situations and it's just more interesting and it's more, it's more focused on the reality that we live every day. New things happen. We need to go figure them out and work at it. When my whole job is staring at a console, I'm very static. Now I can have new and new things going on all the time. It also used to be very centralized decision making, and I think we can push decision making closer to the problem. That means, say, the program manager or the task force leader that you've assigned to a problem, who's the one who knows all the details and knows all the players and has been working that as their task for the last couple of weeks or months or whatever this task force time ends up being, they're way closer to the problem than the CISO is or the CIO is. And we can empower them to make all of those micro decisions about how to react. They don't have to run them up the flagpole. Now, there's still the macro decision, which is definitely a business decision when you're doing something where it might cause impact. Um, and then we've all been focused on detection upstream. And now I think that we can focus downstream on getting all the way to systemic immunity, making sure that what we just detected cannot possibly happen to us anywhere else in the environment. So this is a reference architecture for security operations. It's just another way of articulating what some of the changes are gonna be, but also looking at the whole world of security operations. And so it always starts with people. And here you see the types of roles that are typical. You know, there's lots of different job descriptions and roles and responsibilities that can happen as, as sub to some of these, but the very highest level are these. SOC analysts, intelligence or threat analysts, security engineers, hunters, incident responders. That's a good, you know, solid set of roles in security. And they each have a very large, call it macro process they're responsible for. The SOC analysts monitor, detect, analyze, and declare incidents. Threat analysts collect, analyze, and disseminate intelligence. Security engineers deploy and manage. I mean, it's, you, you see exactly what I'm talking about here. These are the very high level and then all of these areas leverage tools and use them. And that's the technology. And so you can see security sensors around the outside, controls and logs, intelligence information, engineering, hunt, forensics, case management. These are categories of tools that are used within each of these. When we take and fully automate the SOC analyst portion of this, the monitor, detect, analyze, declare incident by monitoring security sensors and logs and you know, using threat, operationalizing your threat intelligence and your asset information and your context, right? It's bringing it all into operational. When that's software, we take a huge chunk of security operations and we automate it and we free up all of those people. We remove all of that process and procedure and we get greater value out of that technology all in one swipe by automating it. Um, more than that, we start to be able to do really advanced things like integrated reasoning. Instead of you know, I'm, I'm a network analyst and I'm monitoring network events, or I'm a hunter and I'm doing this, we start to take all of the context, all of the sensing telemetries, logs, sensors, 
and put them together in software, effectively making a long tail uh, decision. We're taking everything that's observable. What's the probability that you have a real incident given you've seen network intrusion prevention alerts from the same host that you've seen endpoint protection or malware alerts from the same host that looks to be browsing out to newly registered domains via URL filtering. That These things corroborate each other and the volume is so high and the data is so difficult to deal with that those are the types of threads that humans never get to assemble. They don't ever have the time to put all that together. When you put it in software, you start to be able to um, have you know literally multiple opportunities to detect bad as it's in your environment. And the vast majority of incidents that we experience are lateral. They're lateral malware, lateral reconnaissance, lateral exploitation. Those are the dominant form of incidents that we deal with. And we don't even have good lateral sensors deployed because we spent so much time on the perimeter. Um, actually, the inside of the perimeter outbound is where we've been getting our greatest results in security operations lately. We can stop even, well, we won't stop looking at that, but we can add a lot more sensing technologies into the inner part of our environment in order to do a much better job at detection. And actually, this is where we're going to spend a lot of energy tuning up and improving the source data that's used to make these decisions. Right now, because of the constraints, we can't ever consider enough data to make a decision. When we can consider it autonomously, you're talking about a huge amount of data that is now got significant value, right? So I have four or five different opportunities to detect. Now what that used to mean was 500 alerts that I would never get through. Now what that means is a single incident with multiple telemetry supporting it. Um, and that's that logical triangulation. More than that, we can be deliberate. So this is the MITRE ATT&CK coverage. And you'll notice the color coding. Blue is network intrusion detection and prevention. Green is anti-malware or endpoint protection. Purple is URL filtering and yellow is con context and intelligence. And I haven't added EDR, but EDR, endpoint detection and response, would actually cover a number of the things that are in white right now as uncovered. This is what your sensor engineer and your security teams can be working on. They can deliberately manage to ensure that they can cover every one of these attack techniques um, and actually hopefully cover them with multiple telemetries in multiple ways um, and sort of do a very deliberate detection work across the entire telemetry. And you'll notice this goes through basically a kill chain from initial access all the way to, you know, what's the impact of, of your data loss or your breach. And you'll notice that each of these sort of sensor telemetries give you different opportunities to detect at every stage along the way so that you've got it covered even as an attacker progresses step by step through their planned attack. So this is actually quite important and useful and a really good way to articulate how well your sensor grid is performing and what it'll cover. So even more than that, one of the things that we've done in SOC for a long time is we've done scientific management on the people. We've measured how many events they looked at and how many incidents they opened. And, and it's almost been like help desk metrics. And it was definitely not well received and it was not welcome. And it, it, you know, the only types of things that you could really do with it, or at least what I would do with it, is figure out who to team up on shift. If I had someone that looked like they were performing outstandingly and someone whose performance did not look so good, I could potentially put the two of them on shift and they would you know, help each other and get better. Um, but you know, that's a very small win for putting metrics on people, which is just causing you know, morale problems in a lot of times. Um, when we can focus on the sensors, we can do scientific management on the actual sensors themselves. Um, you can also talk about how, what are the sensors that I have? How do I have them deployed? You need diversity of sensors. I want things that will detect things in multiple ways. Um, and one of the things I will say, vendor and sensor selection matters a ton. 
Every vendor is nowhere near as good as the top vendors. There's a huge difference in capability. It's actually something that we can now see after being in the market for a couple of years. The respond analyst has monitored every network intrusion detection vendor across multiple customers for years. We know which who works and who doesn't and how well and sort of what the nuances are. Um, I'm not going to tell you that. We will be publishing some of that later this year um, as we talk about the you know, sort of the results from the respond analyst, but I can tell you now, vendor selection matters. Um, placement, where do we put sensors? Some segments are riskier than others. One of the things that we find is that people are the problem, right? No surprise there, everybody knew that was true. You know, the, the dominant attack method is somebody clicked the link, which means to your enterprise, the way that looks is, there's an internal infected host. That infected host is under the control of an outside entity. That's usually a user's laptop or a user environment, and they begin conducting internal reconnaissance and attempting to spread within the environment using the privileges and trust of that user and eventually you know, trying to you know, use living off the land techniques to not be detected. But the more sensors we put around the user environment, the better job that we are doing protecting um, we also want to put multiple sensors. So this multiple opportunities to tag, I actually call that sensor overlap. I, when I have a user go out to the internet, I want to observe them from three different angles. I want to triangulate their actions. I want some observation on their box, endpoint protection, endpoint detection and response. I want to watch their network traffic. So I want to put them through a choke point and turn on network intrusion detection prevention. We actually catch massive numbers of incidents that are very good with NIDs all the time. And I want to see where their browsing is going. I want to look at their URL filtering and their browsing information. So I'm watching them from three different angles or four different angles while they're doing this. And because I don't have to stream that data to a human, I can actually use it to make deep, more informed decisions. So now I need to design for overlap because it just gives me more information to inform that decision. Um, tuning. This is the thing we see constantly. People turn off all of their low signatures because they assume it's not a big deal. The number one thing that we could detect that would make our lives better and easier is lateral reconnaissance. It's the very earliest stages of an attack, typically, and this is a, a, you know, a bad guy who's very new in the environment conducting reconnaissance. If we can detect them at that point, clean them up, remediate them, and get them out of the environment and figure out how they got in and try and fix that as a, as a systemic problem, that's fantastic. They haven't had the chance to do a huge amount of damage. We caught them very early. Yes, they were in the environment, but they were just beginning to conduct reconnaissance. Um, so that's a, it's a better opportunity. And what that means is that we need to tune up all of the types of signatures. We need to enable as many as possible. Um, and you'll, you'll find this interesting. Um, when we look at the number of IDS signatures that have ever alarmed, we support eight or nine network intrusion detection vendors. Um, and there's about 22,000, 28,000, somewhere in there, relevant IDS signatures today that are deployed by a lot of these vendors. We only see about 1,900, less than 2,000 in years and years and years of monitoring, less than 2,000 of those trigger, have triggered. And the reason is they've tuned all the sensors down. So you bought this super expensive piece of gear that's you know supported and managed and deployed and architected and its primary purpose is observation and you put blindfold on it and said nope sorry we've got to turn the volume down so you can't see anything that's terrible uh, and then logical coverage how are we going to detect what rules do we need what context do we need and this is actually integrated reasoning far better that we do the reasoning but we have that context and the intelligence and all the various components of telemetry to feed that reasoning effectively. Uh, and then also we can put effort into deception. We can put effort into mining the attackers we do find for intelligence so that we can rapidly disseminate that intelligence internally. And you know, as I said a long time ago, apply scientific management to the sensors. So if you look at this chart on the right, this is a sensor suite, two of our customers, 
you know, the bottom one is how many incidents have that sensor produced? And you know, keep in mind, many of the incidents can have multiple sensors reporting information into them, so there's some overlap there. And then how many events did they see? And you'll notice there are sensors that have never seen anything over years. I can count one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, how much do you pay for some of these large sensors? And I've got six of them that have never observed a single event. That's, you know, basically non-functional and super expensive for the lack of function. And then how well are those sensors tuned is the next graph up. How many signatures have alarmed or been observed in incidents so that I know the tuning or the, the functional tuning, meaning it's already been in an incident of the sensor. And then the average probability. This is where using a probabilistic expert system like the respond analyst, we can actually tell you how certain the incidents were when we measured on the back end to understand do we have sensors that perform exceptionally well or non-exceptionally well. So we can start doing really good tuning and adjustment and scientific management of our sensor grid. We're going to get us so much of a better outcome in security operations. So I really appreciate everyone taking the time to hear me talk about where security operations is going and how we are going to transition from a, an operational type organization to something that's really a defensive situation center where we are defending our businesses and operating at the situational level. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions or anything else you'd, you'd like me to answer, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and we'll connect with you and explain more and more about our opinions here. Thank you.